Well, my name's Stephen John James Fitzpatrick Harrison. Apologies for the handle, but it's Irish origin. And I'm a Bachelor of Arts double major in history from 2003 to 2006, both here and at the University of Queensland. I'm practically self-taught and self-teaching now, so anyone I find who's willing to allow me to chew their ear off, I do so. Well, I've been obsessed with it ever since I was a child, and I thought the obsession should lead the, uh, I suppose, the occupation. <laughs> But no, I've always found it particularly fascinating, mainly, I suppose, out of a, how can I put it, I'm comparing it to modern life, I found modern life less tasteful and old life more tasteful. Well, history is fundamentally like learning one's own surname or one's own origins. I mean, without history, it's impossible to have a real understanding of who one is, who one's country. The most curious thing was that an eccentric archipelago of tea drinkers ruled the world in a, such a way that no other civilization has ever succeeded in doing, even to the present day. I mean, America's vaunted superpower status is barely one-fifth of the power that we exercised over the planet less than 80 years ago. Basically, what one is viewing is something that is essentially miraculous. There's no reason why the Britain of the Stuarts became more powerful than the Kingdom of France, for example. Louis XIV's government in France was infinitely more powerful than ours. Likewise, Napoleon was thrashing the Russian Empire, which had about ten times our strength, and even then, after 20 years, as Napoleon grudgingly admitted, it was St George's cavalry that beat him. And when he was referring to St George's cavalry, he was referring to St George on the British gold sovereign. As there was a common saying at the time that Britain would fight to the very last Austrian. I find that our ancestors lived in a way that was in more accordance with nature and with humanity's inherent desire for beauty than we do today. I find that there is a, a pandemic of uglification, to quote His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales in the modern world, that anything beautiful we find, we seem to get our paws upon it and turn it into something ugly and detestable. When it comes down to basic levels of history, at the moment we have an attitude in historical uh, academia that argues that history should be interpreted according to political ideology, whereas history really at all times should be governed by primary evidence. Trying to read a philosophy into that is only of any value if the facts actually dictate that philosophy. But if the philosophy dictates the acceptance of the facts, it becomes propaganda. Because it, it gets to a point where it's impossible to put everything into topics when one sees the holistic picture like I was referring to earlier with the beginning and an end. Instead one sees an entire grand narrative and every part of that is linked and, and thus you learn about one part you inevitably learn about another part which fans into another part which fans into another part. And it gives you plenty of nervous breakdowns but it's lots of fun. Never trust a book published in the British Empire after the 1930s unless you can vet all of its evidence. But preferably the older the better. You know, if you get into history books written especially in the early 19th century you'll find the highest quality of all. And also with regards to any form of primary source, if you find any kind of primary source from any period, whether it be letters, coins, artefacts from that period, diaries, cross-references for ambassadors and courts and things like that, you find the real story of history.